Okay, I'm here with my friend Karan, and he is a microbiologist for Microbiome Labs. But I do want to pick your brain now about the latest pandemic. I'm curious what your thoughts are on it. Uh, what do you think about how it's been handled? And yeah. do, you, do you agree that, I mean, you have two sides kind of going at it right now. You've got those that say, you know, it's only those who are, you know, very immunocompromised that are going to get sick and, um, yeah. or at least that will have the most severe symptoms and have the risk of dying. And then most people are probably going to be fine or will have a mild case. Uh, is that true? Yeah. So there, there is one really important distinction here, right? We, we keep hearing that the vast majority of people will have a mild case. And that's true. That is absolutely true that 80%, maybe even up to 90% in, in some data sets are showing that most people will have a mild case. Um, and then around 10% uh, will need to be hospitalized. And then around 3% will, will actually be very, very serious and will likely succumb to it, or at least have a 70, 80% chance of succumbing to it. What's, what is being left out is what does mild case mean, right? Mild, in this case, is not just the sniffles. This condition is creating mild, meaning not hospitalized, right? So it, you will be the sickest you've ever been in your life. You're gonna feel like you're, you're gonna die in many uh, moments throughout that mild case. We're talking about days upon days of really high fever, very sh uh, lots of shortness of breath, some of the most um, uh, oppressive fatigue people are feeling, um, you know, no appetite, vomiting, diarrhea, all like the worst of the worst. So there are GI <laughs> symptoms for this? Absolutely. More than about 53% in the latest studies okay. present even first with GI symptoms. Because they didn't say that at first. They didn't say that at first. They didn't know that. They were all like, <laughs> what's with the toilet paper? <laughs> exactly. That's what <laughs> cracked me up about it when that study first came out. I opened the study, I started reading it, and I was laughing because I was like, the toilet paper people need something that none of us need. Right? Because right? there were all these memes like, this affects your lungs, not your butt. Well, it does affect your butt, as it turns out. <laughs> and so those people are but just- But only half of them, right? Only about half. About 50%. Okay. About 50 so there's hope. There's hope. I mean, you're losing taste of sense, uh, smell and taste. Um, you know, the shortness of breath is really oppressive. I mean, imagine not being able to breathe as you're walking to the bathroom. Uh, yeah. But if your blood um, oxygen saturation is not below 90%, they're going to tell you just keep staying at home. Um, you know, and then the big problem is you have to quarantine yourself off in one section of your house from the rest of your family, right? So then there's all of these complications of how do you manage a very, very sick person who's having mild symptoms in one part of the house and still help them and service them without having too much interaction because then you can't afford to have everyone else in the house be equally sick, right? Or imagine a household where you have two parents, a mom and dad, and they're both that sick. Who's taking care of the kids, right? Yeah. So it, it's, it's a very, very complicated and complex thing. So, so the problem that we're having is we're hearing these statistics that 80, 90% will have a mild uh, response, but people are thinking mild is just like, oh, it's just a cold, you know, I'll be fine. No, these mild responses are really devastating for a lot of people. You're sick for two weeks, you know, and, and then after you recover, meaning after most of those symptoms go away, your lungs may not function the way they used to function for another two, three weeks, right? You're going to feel fatigue, you're going to get severe weight loss. Um, so all of these things are really can be devastating. So it's not it's not a mild illness in that sense at all. Right now, it's important to note, the way they're defining mild is that you don't have to be hospitalized. Oh, okay. Right? That's mild. That's how all of the CDC, that's how all the epidemiology is defining mild. It means you can try to recover at home. Uh, you don't have to be hospitalized. When your blood O2 drops below um, uh, 90%, that's when they say, okay, you gotta come in because you need supplemental oxygen. And how then you're monitoring their pulse ox at home. Um, well, you, now you can't find the pulse ox meters anymore, yeah. but I think they're doing the telemedicine and, and having them go through symptomology. So oh, okay. they're looking at skin, eyes, tongue, color of nails, things like that, oh, right, trying, right, right. trying to get assessment of where the uh, blood oxygen levels are. But if you have a pulse oximeter, that's the best way. But those have been sold out too now. You can't buy thermometers, you can't buy 
pulse oximeters, none of that stuff is available. It's hard to find. But but that's the key is that you know once you're once it drops below 90, then all of a sudden you're in this risk of spiraling down into ARDS, which is the acute respiratory distress syndrome, which is what then then you're going into a medically induced coma, you're being intubated, and you're trying to they're trying to manage you in the ICU or really serious intensive care. Um, so it is a big, it is a big serious problem. And and the thing is, what what is what is scary about it? But well, let's talk about. And I don't this, I don't want this to be fear mongering either, because there's hope here. There's lots of hope. There's lots of silver linings and all that too. Well, and we should mention those as well, right? But but let's talk about the real risk here. The real risk is that we we used to think when when the first data sets started coming out of China and Japan that it was really only the elderly population that was most at risk of having serious adverse events. 65 and over, and then the risk jumped even higher if you were 75 and over, and then a lot of the people that were dying were over 75, right? Um, so we started thinking to ourselves, ah, the young people aren't really affected. If you're below 60, it's not really that much of a concern. Well, as the disease started moving west, we started seeing that, wait a minute, larger and larger populations of younger people are, are being seriously affected. The data out of New York is showing somewhere around 23 to 25% of the most serious, uh, seriously affected people that need to be hospitalized are under 49, right? Okay, but are you sure, like, how do you know that your data is from, um, you know, sources that are, you know, reliable? Because it seems like there's so much crap in the news, you don't even know who to believe right now. Well, that's the thing. You have to look at data coming out of the CDC and the health departments. That's your best shot, right? I don't know um, how to trust them even, but who knows? Yeah, I mean, you don't know. You don't, nothing is absolute, right? Nobody yeah. is going through and vetting all of this. So you, we have to just do with what we have on hand. Yeah. And, it, and you have to mix the data with what reports you're getting from the people on the ground there. Right, so yeah. when you see interviews and articles and all that from doctors and health practitioners in places like New York and New Jersey, that's what they're telling us as well. And it corroborates with the data that we're okay. seeing. So, so you know that, okay, it's pretty, it's pretty real. Same thing with the data coming out of Italy. The data that came out of China or earlier, we just don't know. We have no idea. No one can verify that information. Um, there's some good published data coming out of China that's gone through peer review a little bit. There are some other researchers from outside of China that have been in Wuhan that are that are collecting data and publishing on it. So that's better. Um, but outside of that, it, it's it's really hard to know. So you have to look at different sources and kind of make your assessment, right? But what we what we're seeing in Italy is the same thing we're seeing in New York and same same thing we're seeing in New Jersey is that um, the older population is getting affected quite dramatically. They're making a rush to the hospital, but it's not just the older population. There's a bigger and bigger chunk of younger people. And the problem is those younger people are typically never in the hospital. And because they're never in the hospital, the hospital system never accounts for a rush of all those kinds of people to the, into the system, so they can't deal with that tidal wave of patients. You know, we're just not equipped for it. We just don't have enough beds, enough, um, healthcare workers, enough, you know, you've, everyone's heard this, enough yeah. yeah, all that stuff. So the equipment's not there, of course, but now we know the PPE issues, the protective equipment. Um, but here's where it also could be, right? And this is, this is another part of it that we just don't have the data on, um, is it also could be much more widespread than we think. We also could already be building herd immunity. We could have as many as 40% of certain states already exposed but recovered, you know, and have immunity against it. We could have healthcare workers who are not symptomatic at all, but have already been exposed and built an immunity against it and didn't actually have any symptoms at all, right? So we could have all those situations going on. And there is a, a, a secondary model coming out of Oxford that is showing some of that. Uh, as what you're saying is things could be a lot better than what we than know. We think. Yes, yeah. um, we could be further in the epidemic curve than we actually think we are. There is a big lag in the epidemic, in the epidemic curve as we know it already, because uh, there, there's a huge problem with testing, right? So we'll talk about the problems. Yeah. There's a huge problem with testing, and there's also a huge incubation period for the virus in many cases. It's up to two weeks. So the data that we're seeing now, like when we get reports today of the number of new cases, 
it's not people who have been exposed today and got sick today. These are people that have got exposed two weeks ago by what was happening two weeks ago. Right. And so all of these measures we're taking in place, all of the social distancing, the closures and all that, we may we will likely not see those effects for another two, three weeks. Right. Because we're now just seeing the impact of the not having the control systems in place. And then it'll take a little time to see the effects of the control systems in place. So the biggest issue that we have with COVID-19 hands down is a lack of data. And that's been the biggest mishandling across the board in most countries. One of the only countries that really ramped up hand, uh, testing very quickly the way they are supposed to is Korea. And in part, and now China claims they have also, but again, you can't necessarily know what, what is yeah. coming up China's actions. But in Korea, in South Korea, we know that they have, and in part because they had to deal with the SARS epidemic and they had to deal with the, uh, with the H1N1, they got hit hard with that as well. So they were much more prepared when it comes to epidemics. So actually when the very first cases started getting reported, um, the FDA version of Korea, the Korean FDA, I think it's called the KFDA, got together five or six of the big, biggest tech and pharma companies and said, we're giving, giving you one week to develop the most accurate tests and we will promise you that we will fast track the evaluation within another week. These are the, the stories, the antidotes that are coming out of there. Um, and, and within like something like two and a half, three weeks, they had two testing options that were already approved by their FDA that were now wide scale and available, right? And we don't have that. Even today, as much as people keep talking about we have a million tests done and all that, I'm talking to doctors. My mom's a doctor on the front line. She's in the, she's, she manages an ICU in Missouri and they have cases there in the hospital. It's taken them seven days to get the results back, right? Here's why it's so important. Number one, if that person's symptoms is not related to COVID, they don't need to be isolated in a ward with other COVID people, right? Because then more than likely they're gonna pick it up. Number two, if they're having things like shortness of breath, you can easily treat shortness of breath with nebulizer treatments and steroids and all that, right? If it's not COVID. If it is COVID, it makes the condition worse. And you don't know that. So you have this patient here who can't breathe and they're basically struggling and they feel like they're drowning. You can't give them the medicine that can help them because you don't know what they have. So steroids make them worse if they have COVID? Yeah, so right now, so certain types of methylprednisone, I, um, oral or IV from, from some of the reports I'm reading can improve, but the typical steroid inhalers that they were given, the nebulizer treatments, they're told not to give them that because number one, it not only can it make it worse, it can also spread it much more readily, right? Okay. Quick side question before I forget. Mm -hmm. Have you also heard that Tylenol and Motrin are both really bad to give someone with this virus? No, the initial reports were that it was uh, ibuprofen. Yeah. It was ibuprofen that was bad. Um, but that was based on a small study that came out of, I think, France. And it was a French health authority that came out and said publicly, don't use ibuprofen. Um, it can make it worse because it can bring down some parts of the immune system that are important for fighting the virus, right? So ibuprofen and Tylenol work differently in terms of its ability to reduce fever. Mm -hmm. um, that was the initial report. Now, of course, the companies that make ibuprofen have come out and said, that's not true, and they've got their reasoning. Yeah. Um, you know, the CDC has come out and said, well, there's not enough data to make that conclusion, but use Tylenol anyway, so we don't know, you know? And so, like, if I was sick with it, I would probably just use Tylenol just to be cautious. Why not, uh, um, why not regular aspirin? You know, the good old aspirin. I mean, I know that there were some concerns about using that years ago. That's why everyone went to you know, ibuprofen and, and yeah, um, aspirin has that the bleeding risk for people and so on. So it depends on the patient. Yeah, right. If, if it's if it's somebody that is a heart patient, stroke patient, diabetic, it or can already be on a blood thinner. Yeah, then they exactly don't it, it, it complicates things. Tylenol is pretty safe in general. Um, and so and if it brings if it manages the fever, um, haven't you heard that Tylenol depletes uh, it starts with a G, it's a long word, something thione. Uh, like a gonadotropin or something like that? Mm -hmm. No. Oh, glutathione? Yeah, say it again. Depletes glutathione? Yeah. Oh. That's what I've heard. I don't know if that's actually good data. Um, well, I've heard it so many different places, though. Not that that makes it true. 
Yeah, I mean, you know, it's it's acute. It's short acting, right? It, it works for four hours. Um, and, and it helps bring down the fever and helps bring down the suffering. Now, my view on it is, um, is of course, if you, can, if you can deal with the fever, keep the fever, right? Uh, now, I totally course, agree. Because the fever is part of your body's defense mechanism. That's so good for your body to have a fever. Totally. Now, there's, there's a very real circumstance where the fever becomes dangerous. Yeah, if it's too uh, high, yeah. If it's too high, and if it starts changing behavior, one well, one of the now, ways. What do you it, see is too high? It, it and it varies from person to person, right? So, like for me, um, if and it's been a while since I've had a fever, but uh, I remember if my fever goes above like one or two, then to me it's a it's too much where you start getting disoriented mm -hmm. and stuff, then it becomes dangerous. At around one hundred one, one hundred one point two, I feel very feverish. I'm tired. I have that chills and all that. Um, but I can manage it. It's not an issue for me. You know, I, I feel the, the real discomfort that the fever brings, but, but it's totally fine. With my kids, like my daughter, she had the flu last year. She was running fevers of 103.5, 104, but still acting completely normal. You know, like she was hot as hell, as you can imagine. Um, she would get tired and lethargic every once in a while, but then she'll jump up and play with the toys. Mm -hmm. And we check her temperature and go, it says 104. Wow. You know, so it's different for different people. Yeah, um, and it's hard as a parent to let that go. It's very hard. It's really, and you and know I, the benefit. Totally. You know, and, and for me, it's especially interesting to, to see because when, when that goes on, I go into parent mode which is not very analytical, not very, you know, you're going and you're all acting in emotion. And so I get worried and I step back and I go, wait a minute, it's clear if she's acting fine, then it's okay. You know, like we don't need to keep hitting the fever with Tylenol, ibuprofen, Tylenol, ibuprofen to keep it down. Uh, but if she starts acting different and appetite loss and all that, then you know, okay, we're getting to a dangerous state. But again, with all of this stuff, you know, the, uh, talk to your doctor, man, manage it with your doctor. There's lots of great telemedicine that's available right now, which is one of the aspects of this industry that's really grown in the last month. And I think it's going to become a bigger and bigger part of our normal healthcare because there, there's, there's so many things that you don't need to go into the hospital for or the doctor's office for that can be managed pretty easily just over the phone. Instead of exposing the, yourself to all of that. Exactly. Because that's the most you know, dangerous place to be is a doctor's office or a hospital. And so you, you actually don't have to go. Do you think the conventional docs, I guess it's going to vary with all the doctors, but do you think they also embrace a, um, you know, a fever the way that you and I do, or are they more trying to get it down too? I know the pediatricians do, um, because in talking to my pediatrician in talking to other people, friends of ours, whose pediatricians we know, they always have this mindset that unless the child's behavior is really abnormal, Mm -hmm. And don't worry about the fever so much because, of course, parents freak out about the fever, right? That's one of the things that we can measure at home. You know, we can't, you know, measure, we can't listen to their breath sounds. We can't do all these blood tests. We can measure a fever. So we measure that. We have that data and we go, holy crap. Mm -hmm. um, but most pediatricians I know will say, yes, they may be at 103 and it sounds scary, but if they're behaving fine, then it's typically okay. You can bring it down if you want with some Tylenol, but if they're behaving okay, it's fine. I think, I think most, most pediatricians are of that mindset following the child's behavior. Um, when it comes to internists and people dealing with adults, I, I don't think they have that similar mindset. I think if you go into the hospital with COVID, um, I think they're going to be very actively managing your fever, but in, in a lot of sense, for probably better reason, you know, um, because they all have more data, right? So one of the big issues with, with COVID and other similar infections is what's happening to your immune system, right? The people that are having the most adverse reactions to this virus, it's not because the virus itself is toxic or producing toxins, like in the case of a bacteria, it's because of how your immune system is responding to it. If you go into respiratory failure, or if you go into multiple organ failure, liver failure, kidney failure, heart failure, which is what's being seen with COVID-19, it's because of how your immune system responds to the presence of the virus. If you are having a really um, strong inflammatory response to the virus, like many of us do to all kinds of things that we shouldn't be having inflammatory responses to, like food antigens and allergens outside and your own tissue in the case of um, you know, autoimmune disease, 
if you're having those kind of responses, then there's a chance your body will respond in that way to the presence of the virus and all the tissues it affects. And that's what's going to drive you into um, crisis mode. You know, so that's, that's the big differentiator, right? And that's why it becomes a little more dangerous as it moves west is because the risk factors start to change. We know clearly age is a risk factor because a disproportionate number of people who are older are being affected in a very serious way. Um, but we also know that diabetes is a major risk factor. And in the US, we have a huge young diabetes population. We know obesity is a risk factor. We have a huge young obese population. We know heart disease is one. We know asthma is one. There are almost 9 million kids in the U.S. with asthma. We, you know, so all of these things that are not just affecting old people are big risk factors for this disease causing a real adverse response. And in the Western world, we are a sick enough population that we have so many people of, of the, you know, the majority of young people have some of these conditions. So you agree that this was a wise move to put us all on quarantine, obviously. Yeah. What do you see happening, though, when we are allowed out again? Yeah. So, you know, I think the reality is COVID-19 is not going away, right? Um, In order for us to actually make the virus go away, you would have to have a very, very, very stringent quarantine. And it would have to be for at least five weeks, meaning nobody's out. Nobody's out doing anything. You know, even these essential um, jobs and all that, a lot of that will have to be quenched. And that's just not feasible, right? We have to do some measures. What we've been doing, the stay-at-home orders from a lot of states and the non-essential functions and all that, that's all really going to help bend the curve and reduce that peak of infection. Um, but it's not going away. I think it's going to be in, in the society, in population for a period of time. The, 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 best, uh, the best case scenario of what's going to happen is we'll start building herd immunity towards it. And again, we don't know if that's possible yet because we don't have enough testing. Like there are antibody tests that you can do that are simple antibody tests to see if you've been exposed to COVID-19 and if you have immunity to it. Oh, right? really? Uh, already, yeah, absolutely. And Are they fact, available? So, in fact, uh, not yet, but they will be. So, in fact, I think Vibrant America is coming out with their own version of the antibody test. And as far as I understand it, they are talking to the FDA right now to get some sort of clearance on it. Um, there are researchers that have already been doing this kind of test on people that have had COVID. Um, the question is, when we get exposed to it, you know, how, how effectively do we build immunity against it? Because we've never seen this before, right? None of our immune systems have ever seen this particular virus. So we don't know how our immune system responds to it. We don't know if we do recover from it, how long that immunity lasts. Um, we don't know how protective that is. We don't know if it's going to scale in, much, in most of the uh, population. For herd immunity to exist, where this virus just becomes kind of a nuisance every year, it might pop up here and there, for herd immunity exists, we need somewhere around 75 to 80% of the population to have immunity against this virus, right? That's when we can sit back and go, all right, it's going to be here and there, it's going to pop up, but it's no cause for alarm, right? And we can get there if we just have the testing in place to know what is happening in hard hit areas, like in New York. You know, New York has something like, I think as of today, maybe 65,000, 70,000 cases, right? And it sounds like a lot. And and in fact, most epidemiological models say when you have such limited testing and you're only testing symptomatic people, you take the number of positive cases and multiply it by at least 10 to understand actually how many people are out there exposed to the the virus already, right? So let's say New York has 650 to 700,000 people that are exposed. You take the number that are positive cases and multiply it by 10. Now, at 700,000 people that are exposed, comparing it to the population of the state, it's still a small amount, right? It's still a relatively small amount of people that are actually exposed to the virus. So it's still not a very prevailing condition. But the reality of it may be that actually 40% of New York's already been exposed to it and already experienced some degree of mild, actually actual mild symptoms and have immunity to it. You know, so you're saying there probably are still going to be some who 
when they say mild, really will be mild. Not Absolutely. mild as in just not in the hospital, like you were saying before. Exactly, because right now the way they're defining the mild symptoms is not in the hospital. But if we have the antibody test to know who's actually been exposed and, and, and then look at them and go, what were the symptomologies you experienced? And then they go, oh, I just had a, I remember having a slight fever and stuffy nose for a few days, you know, and then that, wow, okay, that's a really, really mild response to the virus. That is all still quite possible. The only problem is we don't have the data to know that, right? Um, so what we may find out once we start this kind of testing is 90% of the population gets exposed to it and has a truly mild experience. And those that are seriously symptomatic, enough to go get tested the way it is right now and have fever and body aches and all that for a couple of weeks, those people are actually a smaller percentage of the total population. And those that have serious adverse events are even tinier percentage. You know, it may be instead of 80, 90% having mild as in not needing to go to the hospital, but still really sick, that might actually be 10, 15% of the actual population. And the seriously ill may be 0.1%. And actual 90% of the people actually just have a very mild response. But we don't know any of that without the testing. Because if we did know that and we started to know that, then we could go, okay, we can really start to understand who's at risk, right? Provide them with a little bit more protection and allow most of the rest of the people, especially if you already have antibodies to COVID, to just go about your day like normal. You know, we can change how we're doing things. But in my view, with the data we have right now, what most states have done is the best approach. And we will see the curve start to bend um, in a positive way within a week or two, typically. Oh, good. Okay. Yeah, we will see that. In fact, uh, the, I just saw an article today that some data analytics are showing that we are starting to see a little bit of bend already as of today. Um, keep in mind, because the days are very long nowadays, that <laughs> most of the, um, the stay-at-home orders and the recommendations, both from the federal government and states, didn't really go into effect uh, for much more than a week and a half now. You know, It's been about a week and a half to two weeks. I know in Chicago, the governor closed all the bars and restaurants and all that uh, for, for in-person dining on like the 17th of March, right? So it's only been two weeks. You're too. Yeah. Oh. And so, Tell me if you agree with this. My biggest fear, and a lot of the people that I know, our biggest fear is that they're going to come up with a vaccination that's going to be mandatory. Does that yeah. also scare the hell out of you? It does. It, what scares me about it is I, I think a vaccine to this can be effective, right? It can, depending on how they make it and depending on what happens with the virus between now and the release of the vaccine. That's the biggest problem because um, what we're seeing now is a virus doesn't quite evolve as fast as, let's say, influenza. That's one of the reasons that makes influenza vaccines so ineffective for so many people every year is because the virus is so good at just mutating and evolving that the vaccine doesn't really offer you the protection, certainly not enough uh, you know, to, to overcome the negative side effects of the vaccine. So I choose not to do the influenza vaccine. Um, and so you know, again, that's a personal choice. I don't want to influence people in any way, but that's, that's my choice. Now, that's if this, the, that's the wise choice, I'll say it. <laughs> well, good. I'm glad you do. Um, you know, that, that's anyone that asks me uh, my recommendation. That's what I always tell them as well. Um, now, with this particular virus and, and the fact that it's going to take the vaccine 12, 18 months to come out, what well, does the virus that's... One little pause thing. What scares yeah. me, though, is that they're going to push it through faster just you know, because of everything that's happening, yeah. which is going to mean less, you know, less safety um, considerations because absolutely, yeah, yeah. The, they'll fast track it, right? And and the fast tracking will will negate more of the like what happens long term when you take the virus, you know, uh, when they take the vaccine. Like it might show short term protection, but what is the impact over time with that exposure? Right, with autoimmune uh, diseases in five years. Exactly. Or yeah. Or three years, who knows? Who knows, and, and, and then what they add in there as adjuvants, which is, has been one of the biggest issues with a lot of vaccines is the adjuvants that they add in there. Um, but to me, from a, just a, from a microbiology standpoint, virology standpoint is, if it takes an X amount of time, it takes 12 months, 18 months, let's say, for the vaccine to come out, and now you have this vaccine out there, well, how does that compare to the virus that is now circulating? You know, the good news is this virus does not mutate as fast as a flu, but it does mutate. 
we already know that in the US itself, there's somewhere around 10 different versions of COVID-19 that are circulating. Iceland reported uh, 40 different genotypes of COVID-19 that are circulating in Iceland, right? Wow. So we don't know. So we, it, may, it may just be like, okay, we finally did the vaccine, guys, and then it doesn't really afford protection to the version of the virus that's going on now. But they're going to make so much money on it that they'll still push it on you, unfortunately. They will. And, and, and my concern is making it mandatory, which is that's going to be a big, a big issue. And they will have the grounds to make it mandatory because it is a pandemic. Um, so, so, yeah, I think that's going to be a very difficult issue. Um, how they make the vi uh, vaccine, I've heard what they're doing is look, making an RNA vaccine which is a little bit better than the than vaccines that look at the envelope uh, proteins and capsids. The virus is an RNA virus, right, as opposed to a DNA virus. Okay. So what they're doing is that the way they're making the vaccine, at least from what I've read so far, and this may change, is they're taking portion of the virus's RNA and injecting it into your system. Now, some of that RNA is going to get into your own cells, and your cells are going to be forced to replicate and make more virus capsids or, or virus proteins. And that, those virus proteins will be seen by your immune system without the virulent part of the virus's RNA. And so it'll just give an exposure to your immune system that, hey, this is what the virus looks like and your immune system can mount a response uh, without you actually getting sick and then give you that protection. So that's the idea behind it versus how the flu virus is done where they actually grow infectious flu viruses and things like eggs and so on. And then they attenuate it, meaning they neutralize the, the, the virus. Um, and then they inject attenuated um, flu virus into you, it, the whole virus, essentially. Um, but, you know, this, so it's a different approach of vaccines, which is better. But yes, there's lots of problems with that whole thing. My hope is that we don't, it won't come to that. We won't necessarily need the vaccine as the savior to all of this, uh, which is how it's kind of being set up already. Like, Oh, the big thing that's going to solve this problem is when we all can get vaccinated. You know that. So that 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 narrative hopefully will change uh, for a couple reasons. One is if we start realizing that we are building natural herd immunity, then we won't need to vaccinate everybody. Um, and then number two, if treatments for this prove to be successful, right? So then we won't be as concerned because then for those that do end up having more serious response, we have a treatment. To make sure they don't go, they don't spiral downwards quickly. Um, and so far, those studies are going to outpace vaccine studies, which is good. And these are going to be pharmaceutical treatments. China is doing some really interesting things with vitamin C and herbs, uh, but we're not going to do that in the U.S., of course. Um, but but the pharmaceutical treatments may actually come out much faster and and prove to be effective in the most serious of cases. What do you think about some of the the options and what they're doing to treat it right now? Um, I'm getting reports. So there are reports that are published by the companies, the pharma companies like Gilead that are involved in the studies uh, from the CDC. But I'm actually getting reports from like um, uh, infectious disease doctors in Romania and other places where I know people and I'm, I'm in constant communication with them and they're trying different cocktails of drugs. And there are a number of antiviral drugs that seem to be really effective. Like one of the infectious disease groups in Romania, they reported, uh, they sent me a message and said they've had 55 cases. They've treated them with one of two drug cocktails, and these are widely available antiviral drugs, most of them used in HIV, um, because it's a retrovirus is similar to how this virus functions in some ways. Um, and they've had all 55 people recover and, and be fine and discharge of the hospital. So that it's not a study, it's just, it's anecdotal, but it's promising. You know, and they're doing that in other countries and they're getting, they're putting data out. Um, you know, they, they very quickly approved the off-label use of the malaria drug, uh, chloroquine. The one that Trump got roasted for talking about? Yeah. Um, but the problem with that drug is it's far more harsh than some of these other antivirals because it has all of these potential side effects, including things like vision loss and all that. So it's, it's like, okay, you use it in the most extreme of conditions, like, this person is going to be dead in six hours if we don't do something. And then, you know, you use that drug to try to bring them back. Um, but there are uh, antiviral drugs that are much more gentle on the system that can be used in short term that may provide really good solutions. So 
here's the way I see it. This is my best case scenario, my prediction, right? I think we'll start seeing a bend in the curve coming up here in the next couple of weeks, and it'll be a real bend. We're already, and I was just looking at the data today, trying to make my own personal prediction to my friends and family of when I think the case, uh, new cases will start to drop. But I already saw right before we got on together that there was an article that said we're starting to see a bend uh, in the US. But right now it could be a blip, so we can't say it's certain. But I think we'll start to see a real bend sometime in the next two weeks. By the end of, uh, by the end of mid of April, somewhere around 15, 16, I think we'll see a noticeable change in the number of new cases. The number of deaths will lag behind that and will be 10 to 10, 15 days behind that. And then we'll start to see a lag in that. I think then at that point by, by mid-May, um, early June, we'll start to see a lot more testing, including antibody testing, to understand what percentage of the population actually has already been exposed to this virus and likely has immunity. That's gonna start giving us a lot more breathing room because we're probably gonna find out that a lot more people have been exposed to this than we think. And most people are just dealing with it pretty easily and already have immunity, right? So I think we're gonna, we're gonna be eased into moving about life much more normally at that point. And then by that point as well, by June, July, we'll have a much, much more reports of, of certain cocktails of antiviral drugs that are doing really well for the most extreme cases. So now we'll feel comfortable that, wait a minute, most of us can actually deal with this okay. Um, many of us have already been exposed, so it, it, it's, it's much more common than we think in our society. And for those that have really bad reactions, there is a treatment that will actually help. Um, and, and, we, and the testing will be much more rapid. So the moment you feel symptoms, we can get answers like this because Abbott's already releasing a, a test that'll give you results within 24 hours. Uh, and that test will be in every doctor's offices or can be because it, it's a test in a box, essentially, right? You don't have to send the sample out to the CDC and it's taking like 10 days to come back. Uh, it'll be done immediately like they do with the flu test. Well, that's good. Yeah, so those are all the hopes. To me, the, the fact that companies like Abbott have coming out with these new testing platforms that are quick, rapid, can be done on site, that's gonna be huge. Companies that are coming out with antibody testing to understand who's already been exposed, how many of us have immunity already. Um, the, the, the groups that are doing all the, the studies on the antiviral drugs and the combinations that can treat the most severe of cases. So we don't have that fear that if you have a severe response, there's really not much you can do because right now there's not much you can do, right? If you have a severe response, you're just managing all of the multitude of dysfunctions that are going on in the body. Um, so no, having that comfort that there is a treatment, all of those things will really start to change the landscape of what this is sometime in, in, in the area of June. Uh, but COVID is not going to go away. It'll probably come back in the fall and we'll start to see popping up of cases in the fall. Uh, and then the news media will, of course, love that because that, that's the kind of thing that gets them excited. So you start to see all of these crazy news stories about, it's back, the pandemic's back. Um, You're going to you know, that. You're right. Right. But I think at that point, we'll be, uh, as a society, hopefully we'll have a better handle on it emotionally. Uh, we won't necessarily rush to Costco and buy every roll of toilet paper they have, uh, <laughs> you know, and our doctors will feel much more comfortable about it. We will understand the symptomology better. We can get testing much faster. Uh, and, and we also have some degree of comfort that if we do have a really bad reaction, that there are some effective treatments. Uh, and I think it'll just kind of become a normal part of our, of our things that we deal with as a society. So if you think that the curve is going to make a significant difference in a week and a half or so, what a do you noticeable think? difference. I don't know if significant. I think it'll what it'll tell us. A noticeable. That we difference. are making a bend in the curve. That's so what. What do you? What's your best guess for when we can be released? <laughs> um. Yeah. Like really loosening loosening this up. Well, I want to go to mass again. When do you think I'm going to get to go to mass again? Yeah. I go um, on Easter vigil, but I'm thinking that's not going to happen. No, I don't think that'll happen. I think it's going to be more towards like the end of May, early June, uh, ah. because, because one of the risks that we run, and this is a real legitimate risk, right? If we start seeing the curve bending, the whole reason for the bending of the curve is this isolation that we're doing, right? That's, that's reducing the spread of the virus, and that's good. That's a very positive thing, and we need to do that so we don't overwhelm the system and we don't 
create more havoc where we don't need to create havoc. So as the curve is bending, if you, if you alleviate all the restrictions, it'll immediately take a nosedive back up, right? So then we'll be back to square one. So what we'll have to do is as the curve is bending, we'll just all have to kind of dig in a little bit longer. Another three, four weeks will make a big difference in letting it go way down. We want to be where China is right now. China started, again, let's assume we can trust, trust their data for a second. China started seeing a bending in their curve dramatically about two and a half, three weeks ago. Now their number of new cases is in the single digits. And the only new cases that they're reporting are coming in from outside of the country. And these are Chinese nationals that have been outside of the country that are coming back in now. You know, one of the articles I read uh, just last night showed that they had they reported 31 new cases yesterday in the entire country, uh, which is a tiny amount. And all 31 were from nationals that are coming back in from other parts of the world. Right. So um, in uh, a societal spread has basically shut down in China for the most part. So and, and they've been able to achieve that, you know, three, four weeks after the curve started bending. So we're not that far from being able to do that. Uh, I think we just have to we ha we just have to hunker down just a little bit more. So, what are you guys doing at your house? Like, just going out as very little as possible for groceries, and that's it. We actually haven't gone to the grocery store at all. Um, you know, we uh, I went the last time we went to any store was two and a half weeks ago. Um, we that was there's this kind of a, a a what do you call it like a, a dinner club kind of thing. Uh, that we had a membership with that's closed down to some degree now, but we picked up uh, we can pick pick up these really nice, healthy, prepared frozen meals from them. And we've got a big sub zero freezer downstairs, and so two and a half weeks ago we picked up lots of meals from them, and then we've we got a freezer full. We've been doing delivery of groceries from uh, Whole Foods, you know, uh, Amazon Whole Foods, uh, Oberweiss, you know, Swanson's, all of these. So we're getting. Kind of basic stuff from them so we haven't had to go to the store yet we're thinking we might have to uh, maybe in a week or so just to get more basics because some of those basics are becoming less and less available for delivery um and if that's the case i'll go to the store and you know it's not going to be too much of a risk or too much of a hassle it's make it as quick as you can don't be too close to other people for any prolonged amount of time be very careful about touching your face and all that once you're touching things um you know i'm just going to be sanitizing cleaning my hands as i go in the store, leave the store, get in my car, all of that stuff, come home, washing my hands really cl uh, cleanly, leaving the shoes and jacket that I wore there outside, um, you know, and just kind of cleaning some of the things that you bring in from the store. So just the basic stuff. Um, but, but I don't feel angst or anxiety about going to the store. I think that's totally fine. Um, but, you know, for the most part, we're staying put. Uh, we're going out and playing when it's when it's when it's nice out in the backyard or the front yard. Um, the kids are, um, you know, we have these rules with all the neighbors that we have in our neighborhood. One of our big benefits is every one around us are kids, and they all play together all the time. Our house often is like the central zoo of all of these kids from four or five houses coming in to our place, uh, which is always nice and wonderful. It's all, of course, chaotic and zoo-like. Um, but now all the kids are in, in each of their backyards talking to each other, you know, from the backyard for like hours. You know, my, my daughter is out there on the jungle gym and she's, so she's elevated and she's talking to like three, four neighbor kids <laughs> all at once. And they're playing games somehow, like from that distance of each other. Um, you know, so it's, it's super cute to watch how they're adapting. They're doing a lot more like FaceTime calls with their friends uh, you know, they're doing this, uh, this online um, educational gaming called Prodigy, uh, where they're playing against their friends. It's really cool. They're doing Zoom meetings with their friend groups. Um, so they're adapting and they're doing fine. Um, and, I, and like I said before, for me, I'm still in that phase um, where I'm still enjoying my time at home because I'm never home, you know. Um, never has there been in the last four or five years more than a two-week period that I'm at home. And so, you know, now it's almost going on 30 days that I've been home. And uh, so it's a big change and it's a welcome change for me in that respect. Yeah, that's a nice um, little benefit for you, Karan. It is, just a silver lining in, in it, you know? And, I'm, and because the kids are home too, then we're like, we're actually spending a lot of time together, which has been really nice and, and uh, you know, uh, really fulfilling. But I'm sure in a couple of weeks, they're going to be ready for me to get, get out of the house and <laughs> I'm going to be ready to get out, but um, it won't be time yet. Okay. So I thought of one more question. 
how do you think this virus originated? Ah, um, it's, it's, it's really interesting. Now, there's lots of people uh, putting out conspiracy theories around it. I don't typically subscribe to conspiracy theories, but there are some that are compelling and I think it's worth looking into, right? Some of the things that are really interesting is, um, you know, in that Wuhan region, it is a, there is a big virus research facility. Um, so that is an unusual coincidence. It's fishy. Um, it's fishy. It's fishy. You know, there's no definitive information, uh, but it's fishy. And and researchers out of that region, uh, and I, I haven't fact-checked this yet myself, but I've seen things about it, is researchers out of that um, region have been publishing on a SARS-CoV-like virus, a chimera type of virus. Um, in the past, this was two, three, four years ago that they've published on it. Um, so it's fishy, it is. But looking at it from a normal perspective, just let's say none of that information is there, you're just looking at it from nature and science, it's absolutely plausible, uh, the zoonotic transfer, because it happens all the time. All of the H1 and uh, HXNX uh, influenza viruses all came through zoonotic transfer, right? All the bird flu, the swine flu, all of those are zoonotic transfer. That means viruses jumping from animal species into eventually the humans. Um, and, and SARS came through that vector, MERS came through that vector, um, AIDS, HIV came through that vector. So it is a very, very real vector. And in fact, global pandemic groups through the WHO and all have been observing and monitoring uh, SARS-like viruses for a long time because of the potential for zoonotic transfer. Um, the, uh, the World Health Organization actually has thousands of strains of viruses that are known that are in certain animal groups that they monitor all the time, uh, especially in birds. And because there are number of H7, N5, H6, N3 that, are, that could be really deadly and but are but still are in birds right now so the moment the virus mutates where they can then infect the human uh, that's when they become really dangerous so everything about this is completely plausible and and capable naturally as well you know so because of that um i i, I shy away from the um from the conspiracy theory Again, if this it's was, still hard to know about that stuff it's really hard to know you, you just don't know um it, You'll never know, right? You know, nothing about that will ever be cleared up. Um, but what, one of the things we do know is that it is it is very probable and plausible from the natural course as well. And in fact, it's so probable and plausible that numerous researchers have published on this after the SARS uh, epidemic itself, whenever that was nine years ago or so. When the SARS epidemic uh, hit, there were publications on the chances of a SARS-like virus, but mutating to be a lot more contagious and a lot more transmissible between humans. Um, part of the predictions was that it would retain its really high mortality rate that SARS had, but, but also develop this really high level of contagiousness. What saved us on that SARS epidemic, by the way, I don't know if your people, uh, your audience is, is familiar, but uh, you know, the original SARS epidemic basically kind of came and fluttered out, right? Most people didn't really pay attention to it. It, it really happened mostly in Asia. It didn't really come to, the, to North America much, um, but that's because it wasn't a very contagious version of the virus. And you were only contagious after you developed symptoms. And the moment you develop symptoms, you were really sick where you weren't really going out there and passing it to anyone, right? See, that, that is more manageable, obviously. That's totally more manageable. It was like, um, it was something like 8,000 cases globally and 800 deaths. So it had a very high mortality rate, a 10% mortality rate, which is somewhere around 10 times higher than this particular virus, but it was not at all contagious. So that was very well contained. Imagine if this virus had a 10 fold mortality rate, right? We would, right now, I think globally, what do we have? 35,000, 40,000 people dead. We'd already have close to half a million people dead, um, you know, and then it would just be climbing. So, um, you know, that that's the big difference. But then after the SARS epidemic, lots of researchers have published on the types of mutations that could occur in these family of viruses that could make them much more contagious. And sure enough, it's happened. You know, but science can be very predictive that way because you know you could see what hap what can happen. It's it's uh, it's possible. I I I've spent a little bit of time thinking about the conspiracy theories, and you know you think about like okay, who is to to um, 
benefit from something like this? Is it an accident that something like this got out or was it purposefully sent out? And I, it's hard for me to wrap my head around like who could see the benefit of this, right? I think Are that- the companies? Possibly, but the problem with it is you don't know, like you cannot predict where a pandemic's gonna go, right? The, the, the economy may implode so much that those companies before they ever have a solution will be completely gone. That's true. You know? And so you just don't know. It's too big of a risk from a business perspective to do that. Uh, and, and they already make so much money and have so much access to so many things that it's just not worth for them creating a world pandemic for a business opportunity. Yeah. Um, so just being a business owner myself and understanding the business aspect of it, it just doesn't make sense. Uh, is it biological warfare? Maybe, but you know, I mean, it affects the entire world. So it's, it's, um, it's, it's hard to think that you would release something like this as a, as a weapon when it impacts the whole world almost equally. Yeah. Um, so yeah, it, it's, it's hard to develop the reasons, but just note that this can and does happen in nature all the time as well. So this is not one of those things like how in the world did it happen? It happens all the time. Okay. Uh, and, and the world health organization continues to monitor these types of things. Karan, thank you so much for answering all these questions. My pleasure. Hopefully this was an interesting conversation for people. Um, I'm going to try to get it up soon. Yeah, well, I love it. Well, it's it's been my pleasure. And uh, you know, one more message about the about the the SARS, uh, sorry, the the COVID two, um, the COVID nineteen disease is that it, it is illuminating one thing for us that I think those of us that aren't really dramatically impacted by it right now, meaning we have loved ones who are you know gravely ill in hospitals that you can't visit, and I mean, there's a lot of emotional distress going on. People who are economically really affected by this. For those of us that have the fortune and the luxury of not being yet devastated by this, um, it gives us an opportunity to kind of reflect upon what does this say about our society and about us as a species. This virus targets a receptor that indicates weakness in our system, right? And it's, and it's evolved so superbly to do that. The, the ACE2 receptor that the virus binds to is a receptor when expressed at high levels indicates that the individual is sick and has a compromised system. The problem in the Western world is we have so many people that are sick in that sense, meaning they have chronic inf inflammation, chronic distress in their body, and so they're expressing this target for the virus at really high amounts. So it illuminates uh, something that biology is telling us, this, this pathogen has figured out a weakness within us that, that resembles a lack of resilience. And so this tells us that, hey, this is not gonna be the last pandemic we're gonna see. There's more than likely another one coming around the corner in, in a matter of years. Um, and, and we need to improve our resilience. All of the things that we've all been talking about in the health food space and the functional medicine space about improving your overall health becomes even more important and clear now because it's those same risks that we're trying to, to, trying to address that lead to heart disease and diabetes and cancers and all that. That same risk is what this virus targets, right? So, so it's illuminating our lack of resilience because of our chronic illness. So we can make ourselves more resilient. So when we come out of this, let's come out of this healthier, stronger, smarter, let's study a little bit more, you know, and then and we'll come out of it with a really healthy appreciation for how important human contact is, right? Because uh, we, we take that for granted, right? I mean, I am jonesing to sit down with people for dinner and talk. Me too. Right? Like, oh my God, it's like, I can't wait to have a glass of wine with friends. I was just gonna say that, to have a glass of wine with, a, with a, you know, music in the background. And <laughs> yeah, and we take that for granted, right? In, in, in the world that we live in. And, uh, and really, at the end of the day, we need more of that. That kind of stuff is healthier for us in general, outside of this epidemic uh, scenario. So once this is gone and this is under control, which it will be, this will be gone and will be under control uh, at some point, we need to take stock of that and remember where we are right now and go, we really need time with each other. Um, and that is so important for our overall health and wellness. Yeah. So that's just uh, you know a little message on the side. So two more thoughts on that. First of all, I feel really bad for the people who live alone. Because yeah, oh my God, yeah. there's six of us in, in our family here. So we still have plenty of interaction, you know, with each other, which I'm grateful for. Um, but I do feel bad for people who are alone or um, 
you know, you think about maybe kids in not very good home situations and that kind yeah. of stuff. I've been praying a lot about that stuff. But yeah. the other thing is, so, you know, you wonder, you know, you and I try to be healthier. You know, mm-hmm. we eat pretty well. We get exercise. We sleep. We do all the things, hopefully, you know, not perfectly, mm-hmm. but, you know, that's what we don't know yet. It's right. going to be interesting to see on the other side of this, does it make a difference? You right. know? That, you know, it's going to be very interesting, but yes, I do hope that it kind of brings a greater awareness to everyone that, and I've been talking a lot about the ways to build up your immune system. I feel like that's really all we can do right now is just do the that's best awesome. to build up your immune system. And some people are going to do it and some people just never will probably. Yeah. But hopefully you're right that it brings a greater awareness to people that this really does make a difference. It does. It's your ability to be resilient. You know, it's, um, uh, and and a, a virus like this, and this is not the only virus that targets the ACE2 receptor. Um, SARS, the original SARS, MERS does too. So a lot of influenza viruses can. Um, so a lot of pathogens look for vulnerability in our system and indications of weakness in our system. And so the more we improve our overall health, the more resilient we become and the less we become a target for these things. And so, um, you know, that, that's just a lesson to keep in mind. And uh, while you're at home and not going out, it's a great time to take stock of how can I change the things that I've been doing to really become more healthy and more resilient. Um, you know, and I, and I see a lot of people doing that because, uh, you know, a lot of sales on nutrition and supplements and all that have gone up. So people are becoming more aware. Um, they are taking more of their health in their hands, uh, which is smart. And I think people need to read more and study more and just more. <laughs> exactly you know like watch programs like this you know i mean kelly brings you all kinds of great information all the time through all her effort um so there's a lot of good resources out there and people just need to kind of dive a little bit deeper into that and um advocate for themselves you know in in this kind of condition there's no treatment for this there's no prevention for this the only thing we can do is make ourselves more resilient and make ourselves less of a target for it. right well thank you again karan this was a great Thank you.